Since June of 1940, the Mediterranean island of Malta was under siege. A new front had opened in Africa and Malta found itself to be right in the middle of a fierce battle between the British air and sea forces and those of Germany and Italy. The island began the war very poorly defended and British defences of Gloucester Sea Gladiators and Hawker Hurricanes were struggling to hold on to the island. If it falls, then the Axis powers will invade. If it remains under Allied control, then Germany will be defeated in Africa. The battle for Malta must not be lost. Sitting 50 miles south of Italy, and approximately 200 miles off the north coast of Africa, is the small island of Malta. It has long been of huge strategic importance, and it officially became part of the British Empire in 1814 as part of the Treaty of Paris. It was used as a shipping waypoint and fleet headquarters by the British, and its position halfway between Gibraltar in the western Mediterranean and Egypt in the east made it a prized asset. Following the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, it was considered a vital part of the trade route to India. In the 1930s, Malta housed the headquarters of the British Mediterranean fleet, but as war approached, the British government took the opinion that the island was far too difficult to defend, and considering its proximity to Italy, the decision was taken to move the fleet headquarters from Valletta in Malta to Alexandria in British-occupied Egypt. This move was completed by October of 1939. Now the island of Malta had been stripped of its naval protection, save for the monitor HMS Terra, a handful of British submarines, and six obsolete Gloucester Sea Gladiators, with another six in storage. On the 10th of June, Italy declared war on the United Kingdom and France. Italy had for a while been seeking to expand its territories in the Mediterranean and Africa, and following the Allied defeat and the capitulation of France that same month, Italy saw an immediate opportunity. Within hours of declaring war, bombs were falling on Malta. Following a week of heavy aerial bombardment, 12 Fairy Swordfish torpedo bombers of the fleet air arm flew into Halfar Air Base, having escaped the situation in France, and were quickly put to use in taking the fight back to Italy. Meanwhile, back in Britain, the Chiefs of Staff were still of the opinion that due to Malta's location, it was indefensible, and there was nothing practicable that could be done. Prime Minister Winston Churchill disagreed, and in July of 1940, he insisted that Hawker Hurricanes be flown in at the earliest possible moment. Now this was to be no easy task, when you consider that Malta is some 1,100 miles, or 1,800 kilometers, from Gibraltar and simply out of range for a single-seat fighter. The plan, therefore, was to establish ferry runs using aircraft carriers with cruisers and destroyers for protection, and sail to within range of Malta where the hurricanes could be flown off the carriers and land on the island, giving Malta a desperately needed air defence capability. The first of these took place between the 31st of July and the 4th of August 1940 when HMS Argus successfully sailed from Gibraltar and delivered 12 Hawker Hurricane fighters. The following months would see other carriers joining HMS Argus, such as HMS Arcroyal, HMS Illustrious, HMS Victorious, HMS Furious and HMS Eagle. As these ferry runs became more established, using ships from the Gibraltar-based Force H, also known as the Club, the operations became known as Club Runs and they provided much needed supplies and reinforcements to Malta. Not just hurricanes, but also fairy albacores and fairy swordfish. For the rest of 1940, Malta would continue to receive these supplies, despite the Axis forces developing defensive countermeasures to disrupt this supply line. The aircraft would often be attacked either in the air or on the ground, and the carriers themselves became prime targets, and each club run became more and more complex to defend. 1941 and the Italian forces are starting to become more stretched due to the African campaigns and suffering several defeats. So Germany now decides to come to Italy's aid and participate themselves in the attacks on Malta. And by early 1942, the superior, more modern German fighters were starting to get the upper hand over the struggling hurricanes. And in fact, it was reported by several hurricane pilots that the Germans deliberately flew their Bf 109s in front of the hurricanes to show off their vast superiority. So, the response from Britain was to supply Spitfires to join the fight. 
The first attempt to deliver 15 Spitfire Mark V Bs was to take place in February of 1942, but had to be aborted due to a fault with the external fuel tanks that had been fitted. And by the time this fault had been rectified, Malta had only 32 airworthy Hurricanes available for action. Time was running out. On the 6th of March, carriers HMS Argus and HMS Eagle, with battleship HMS Malaya, cruiser HMS Hermione and nine other destroyers for protection, sailed from Gibraltar with the 15 repaired Spitfires on board. These were successfully flown off and under the guidance of seven Blenheim bombers, they arrived safely on the 7th of March. Later that month, further Spitfire reinforcements arrived from HMS Eagle and HMS Argus to add to the Hurricane fighters. And on the 27th of March, a further 10 Hurricanes arrived from North Africa. But it was now becoming clear that the modern German fighter aircraft, such as Messerschmitt Bf 109s, Bf 110s, and Junkers GU 88 night fighters, were totally outclassing the older British Hurricanes, and the RAF was suffering heavy losses of both aircraft and pilots. With the Axis forces now beginning to swing the aerial advantage back their way, it was becoming more urgent to supply higher numbers of Spitfires to Malta. By April of 1942, suitable British aircraft carriers were in short supply. HMS Ark Royal had been sunk in November the previous year, and most of the modern aircraft carriers did not have aircraft lifts big enough for the Spitfire wingspan. They had been designed for modern carrier-based aircraft with folding wings. With the situation becoming urgent, Winston Churchill issued a plea to US President Franklin D. Roosevelt for assistance. It was agreed to loan the American carrier USS Wasp for a club run. The reduced size Yorktown class ship arrived in Glasgow, Scotland on the 13th of April 1942 and began loading 52 Spitfire Mark V-B aircraft of number 601 and 603 squadron. She sailed for Gibraltar the following day on the 14th of April 1942, accompanied by destroyers USS Lang and USS Madison as well as battlecruiser HMS Renown. As they sailed past Gibraltar, they were joined by seven more British cruisers and destroyers for protection as they embarked on the perilous leg to Malta. On April 20th, 1942, at 0400 hours, 11 Grumman F4F Wildcats were launched to establish a combat air patrol over the naval force. And shortly after, at 0530, one by one, the Spitfires roared down the flight deck of USS Wasp and into the air. Despite having no guide aircraft, 46 of them successfully reached Malta and the airfield at Takali. Unfortunately, as with previous club runs, the Axis forces had anticipated the arrival of the Spitfires and within minutes of their arrival in Malta, they were attacked. And over the course of the next 48 hours, all the Spitfires were destroyed, either in the air or on the ground. The situation in Malta was now becoming critical and a repeat operation was hurriedly prepared. USS Wasp returned to Glasgow on the 29th of April 1942 and loaded another 47 Spitfire Mark V Cs and after joining up with her escorting force on the 3rd of May she once again set sail for Gibraltar. Upon arrival at Gibraltar on the 8th of May she was joined by carrier HMS Eagle which had been loaded with a further 17 Spitfires which had been delayed from earlier club runs. And the following day 9th of May after arriving in the launch area USS Wasp launched its aerial protection of 11 Wildcats and the first to launch its Spitfires was HMS Eagle, followed by USS Wasp. The first Spitfire to launch lost power immediately after takeoff and crashed, killing the pilot. Another Spitfire, flown by Canadian Pilot Officer Gerald Alpine Smith, was unable to start drawing fuel from its external fuel tank. This would make it impossible for it to reach Malta and so had to withdraw from the formation. Faced with the prospect of ditching his aircraft or attempting to land his Spitfire back on board USS Wasp, something that had never been done before, he chose the latter. And with the approval of USS Wasp's captain, the carrier prepared to recover the Spitfire. The crew cleared the entire deck and the ship was accelerated to maximum speed. Miraculously, Pilot Officer Smith got his aircraft onto the deck and brought it to a full stop just 15 feet, some 4.6 meters from the forward edge of the flight deck. For his airmanship, he was unofficially awarded the American Navy wings aboard USS Wasp. On the island of Malta, lessons had been learned from the previous delivery of Spitfires and plans had been put in place to turn around the newly arrived fighters as fast as possible and get them back in the air for the expected Axis attacks. 
They were rapidly refueled, rearmed, and with a fresh pilot at the controls, they were airborne and waiting. The Italian force of bombers and escorting fighters were soon seen off, and the German attacking force lost 47 of their aircraft, for the loss of just three British aircraft. Now that Malta had a stronger air defence, with ever-increasing numbers of newly arrived Spitfires, spare parts and crews over the next few months' club runs, the daylight bombing of Malta came to an end when the Germans called off the offensive in favour of sending air support to North Africa. And from October of 1942, the Spitfire Mark 5C had been modified further, with additional fuel capacity, both internal and external, to make the journey from Gibraltar to Malta possible, and so, in time, the club runs became redundant. The Allied's success in maintaining control of Malta would go on to be an essential factor in the eventual Allied success in North Africa.